Let's talk through the Wartspawn manifestations of the Ruinous Powers themselves with an overview of the Chaos Demons army in 10th edition Warhammer 40k. Hello and welcome back to Warspets Tactics where today we're doing an army overview and in this video I thought we'd talk through the Chaos Demons in 10th edition, talking through all the rules in their index and each data sheet, focusing a little on some of the stronger and weaker options for the army. Demons always tend to be a bit of an oddball faction in Warhammer 40k, maybe with a bit of a tendency either to be very strong or very weak as a result. They function differently to a lot of factions on a whole load of different levels. They've got invulnerable saves instead of armour, so high AP enemy weapons are sort of wasted, but are more vulnerable to volume fire. They're a very heavily melee focused faction, so how easy they can get there is often a big deal. Their tactics involve striking out of the warp, with all of them having deep strike and often able to teleport across the battlefield in one way or another. And they also function as four mini armies themed around the four chaos deities, meaning that quite a lot of units won't necessarily help out each other on the tabletop if you run a multi-god army. In 10th edition 40k so far, they've been a fairly strong faction. They were around about 50% wins before the balanced data slate, which was pretty nice. Though I'd say that the points changes of Games Workshop's first balanced data slate of 10th edition have hurt them a bit. Most of the top and optimised tournament options went up a bit, though really quite a lot of the rest of the index went down. It's perhaps been a bit of a side grade for Chaos Demons overall. If you play with a slightly less optimised and more casual list, then you might well have seen your army improve. If you are playing with a top tournament optimised competitive list, then Demons overall might have got a bit weaker with increases to some of the better greater Demons and a few of the other good support options. Overall though, they still seem to be holding their own given that a lot of the other good factions in the game got worse nerfs than they did. Their win rate seems to be around about 49% in the new meta, though it's early days at the moment. Getting into the index and the rules proper though, and the index is a fairly typical one for Warhammer 40k, they have the Shadow of Chaos as their faction rule, that's all about controlling areas of the board, and if you can hold the objectives around it, then you get some good buffs for your units for various stratagems and things. Plus you get to play some games with Battleshock, both healing your own units and killing some of the enemies. There's some allies rules called Demonic Pact, that means that the other Chaos armies can borrow any good data sheet that they want from Chaos Demons, it does mean that they're a particularly good army as allies. And their initial 10th edition launch detachment is the Legion's Demonica detachment, this allows you some close deep strike with Shadow in the Warp coming in just outside of 6 inches of enemy units, and that allows you to charge into melee really quite easily indeed. And there's a bunch of stratagems that often play into the Shadow in the Warp in quite a big way, and 4 enhancements each themed around 1 Chaos Deity each. Then there's 55 data sheets, 12 Korn, 13 Zinch, 12 Nurgle, 14 Slanesh, and 4 unaligned ones. Belakor, the Soul Grinder, and the Demon Princes, all of them having their points cost in the Munitorum Field Manual. As I mentioned earlier, there have been quite a lot of shifts around since 10th edition came out. Getting into their faction rules, and first up we have the Shadow of Chaos. This basically marks out different areas of the board to be under your influence. You always get it in your deployment zone, no questions asked, so opponents venturing into it are going to be at a bit of a disadvantage there. And then the influence for the other two zones, the midfield and the enemy deployment zone, that's checked at the start of every phase. If you control at least half the objective markers within each of those zones, then the area is said to be within the shadow of chaos, and then it's basically checked on a per phase basis after that. It does mean that if you say lost some units and your opponents had more models on an objective, then they could rid themselves of the shadow of chaos say halfway through their own turn or something. On the core rule, the shadow of chaos is mainly a battle shock thing, though it does have quite a lot of other relevance for things like the warp rifts from the detachment rule, as well as certain stratagems and datasheet abilities. If your units are depleted but not destroyed and you need to test Battleshock, then you get a plus one to the test, which is kind of handy. And should that test be passed, then you get an extra D3 wounds regenerated on your injured model, or D3 models restored to the unit if you, it was a battle line unit testing. That one can be fairly punishing if your opponent leaves units that are badly damaged but can't quite kill them, means they can slowly regrow over time, particularly for the lesser demons. The flip side of that is Demonic Terror, that's the enemy debuff one. Each time you're within the Shadow of Chaos and your opponent needs to test Battleshock, then you subtract one from the test. If the test is failed, then they also take D3 Mortal Wounds as well, killing a few more of them. Overall, I feel like the core ability of the Shadow of Chaos with the Battleshock buffs and debuffs is handy, though to be honest it's probably not the biggest impact area of the rule. 
I feel like the stratagem buffs and the warp rifts are actually some of the biggest areas where it's going to impact the game, though the battle shock things are kind of a nice to have. I feel like on some tables at least you might struggle to uphold shadow in the warp for long periods of time against your opponents. If there's only three objectives in the midfield, then you're probably going to be each having one safe one and then fighting over the central one. If there's a fair bit of back and forth and you and your opponent repeatedly take it off each other, then the shadow is going to be down for quite a lot of time, including kind of importantly when your reinforcements might want to come in. Finally, for a bit more reliability, there are some other ways to generate shadow in the warp. Bellacor just comes with a bubble of it all by himself, and that's a seriously powerful ability to have. And he can also do a 1 command point stratagem to corruption objective to guarantee that you get some shadow in the middle of the board. That can be quite useful for some scary close range deep strike if the opponent tries to approach it. Talking of the other main benefit of Shadow of Chaos, the Elysian's Demonica launch detachment is warp rifts. This one will just be one option amongst many when the Demon's Codex comes out, but that's not going to be for a while yet. Confirmed by Games Workshop not to be until at least next summer, and it could be far later. The Warp Rift special rule allows you to deep strike unnaturally close to your opponent. Usually you'd have to set up somewhere greater than 9 inches away from them. If you deep strike a unit in the Shadow of Chaos, then you get to pop it up anywhere that's just greater than 6 inches away, and that will both let you drop some units a lot closer to the enemy than they might be expecting as well as get some very short charges out of Deep Strike with melee units that you might want to get stuck into the enemy. As mentioned, the timing of the Shadow check is maybe a little bit unfortunate, as you check Shadow at the start of the phase, so it means that if you didn't have it established in the mid-board before movement, then you can't move units onto objectives, establish the Shadow, and then allow the close-range Deep Strikes. You could potentially have other ways around that though, such as using Bellacore or that Corrupted Objective stratagem. Being charged almost directly out of reserve with good reliability is very scary though. A 6 inch charge typically succeeds around 73% of the time, and it means that it's very very likely with a command point reroll in place as well. It means that an enemy unit could be entirely safe on one side of the map, and then all of a sudden be in combat with basically no chance to react in between. This rule basically means that having at least some units in deep strike reserve is basically mandatory. Between this and rapid ingress, you could have lots of charges that just come out of nowhere and hit the enemy very hard. Moving on to the stratagems next, and for one command point we've got Corrupt Real Space. This is that objective one that I mentioned. One command point for an objective that you control in your command phase, and you make this objective a sticky objective, so it remains yours until your opponent can actually take it at the start or end of any turn. But on top of that, it projects a 6 inch aura of shadow in the warp around it, and that means that you're guaranteed to have at least some in the midboard until your opponent can shut it down. The sticky objective thing is at least fairly handy, it means that if your demons get gunned down then it still will be your objective if your opponent can't reach it which is nice. It does perhaps feel a bit of a preemptive way to spend a CP though. The midboard shadow in the warp can be really good though, if at the start of the turn you don't have the shadow of the warp in the midboard, this could be a way to allow you to get a 6 inch charge on at least one enemy unit if there was still at least one objective that you controlled. Next up for 1 CP we've got Warp Surge, advance and charge for units within the Shadow of Chaos. Pretty handy to have, though usually going to be dependent on having it active in the midboard potentially. I feel like this one's perhaps most reliably useful with Bellacore, he could use it to catapult himself into combat, or do the same with other scary greater demons nearby, like say Keepers of Secrets or Bloodthirsters. Advance and charge can be pretty big if it's going to be the difference between you making a key charge or failing it. For 1 CP we've got Draft of Terror, this gives you an extra AP-1 when you're either shooting or fighting. That one's a reasonable enough damage buff, it kind of depends on what you're attacking though, generally going to be best if you've got a really big demons unit attacking something with a really high save like a 2 plus or a 3 plus without an invulnerable save. Sometimes it's absolutely going to be worth it. Realistically it's going to be far better though if the opponent's unit is battle shocked, as if that's the case then you also get to re-roll the wound roll against the target as well as the AP buff, and taken together that's pretty massive. It's maybe a little bit on the situational side given that you can never really guarantee that any one important thing is going to fail battle shock, but could be a good opportunity to look out for as it could translate to a lot of damage. For 1 CP, Denizens of the Warp is a very nasty trick to have in the toolbox. This one's another thing that allows you to come in from Deep Strike, and if you're willing to sacrifice the potential to charge later in the turn, then it allows your units to drop anywhere that's greater than 3 inches away from enemy models, potentially again reaching areas of the board that otherwise will be completely screened out. 
Some of the best times to use this will be when you can directly gain some victory points from it, say if it allows you to drop a unit into a position where you could do a secondary objective that you wouldn't be able to otherwise, things like behind enemy lines, or getting into the table quarters, or even drop on a partially defended opponent controlled objective. If they've got a unit that's not directly on top of the objective, but is just on the edge of the objective, there should be enough room for your units to come down and steal the objective off them. If you can do that at the same time as get a scary shooting demon unit into a position to inflict some key damage, then so much the better. Next for 1CP we've got Realm of Chaos. This one's a nice one to pull units from the board and return them to strategic reserve. And then they get to return to the board by a deep strike in your next movement phase. You get to target one unit with it normally, or two units if they're both within the Shadow of Chaos. You trigger it at the end of the opponent's turn, so it means that if they don't destroy a unit and they don't lock it up in combat, then it can just disappear up into the sky. And then they can be hit by a lot of strikes from reserve the very next turn, potentially ready to do a 6 inch charge if they can do it within the shadow, or just turn up and either threaten a normal charge or do some shooting. It means that you could have really quite a lot of demons that were on the board suddenly jump into the opponent's backfield if you wanted to, and you could potentially use this as a bit of an alpha strike type thing or getting a lot of early game control. If your opponent goes first, then you could be having deep strikes turn 1 with this from units within your own deployment zone. Finally, for 1 command points, there's Demonic Invulnerability. This allows you to re-roll invulnerable saves of 1 versus shooting attacks. It's a small durability boost, but honestly it's not really all that exciting, I think. It equates to a 17% durability boost against just about anything. If you've got a 4 plus invulnerable save, it's even worse for a 5 plus. Most of the time that's just not really going to be worth it, and it would have to be a very big important unit taking an awful lot of firepower to be worth it. And if you were just being hit by a few really big shots, you might actually be better off just command point re-rolling one of them as opposed to spending the CP on the re-roll ones. Overall though, I feel like the demons have access to some really quite powerful stratagems. I really like the options to put things off the table and to deep strike them within 3 inches. Lots of very gamey things that you can do with that and just keep the enemy army on the back foot. Most of the rest are fine situationally as well. Warp Surge could be very nice for Bellacor and friends. Corrupt Frill Space might be worth it if you don't think that you can maintain the shadow of the warp for the entire No Man's Land. Draft of Terror is a bit niche, but if something important fails Battleshock, then that could be worth it then. I feel like Demonic Invulnerability might be perhaps one of the weakest of them actually. Would have been far more tempting if it was something like a plus one to invulnerable saves for a turn. Next up we've got four Demon Enhancements, one for each deity. First up we've got Argath King of Blades for 20 points, that's the corn one. A nice simple plus one attack and plus one strength, or plus two to both if you're in the Shadow of the Warp. Probably the one that you take on either a Demon Prince or a Bloodthirster if you've got some points left over. An extra two attacks with the Great Axe of Corn that the Bloodthirster can hold is no bad thing at all. For Zinch we have the Everstave at 25 points. This one gives you plus one strength and range to your ranged weapons, doubling it up in the Shadow of the Warp once more. This one's really quite a common take on the Lord of Change as it gets his weapons up to strength 10 or 11 and 21 to 24 inch range. I think the strength buff is enough to be quite meaningful against any sort of medium armor type units. For Nurgle we have the Endless Gift. This one's 30 points and gives you a 5 plus feel no pain. It goes up to a 4 plus feel no pain in the shadow of the warp which is pretty massive. It is perhaps a little bit balanced out on the Great Unclean one though which is the first one that you'd think about going for it. As he already has a 6 plus feel no pain so it's a relatively slightly lesser buff on him than the rest of the army. It's still a bit expensive to use on anything else but him though, and getting an extra 25% or so durability is kind of fine. In Shadow of Chaos though, that's going to make him kind of monstrously durable. I think I would be tempted to pick that up if I was running a great unclean one. Finally for Slanesh we have Soul Stealer for 15 points. This one's the chance to regenerate wounds from slain enemies. Usually it's a 4 plus to regenerate 1 wound, or a 3 plus if you're within the shadow of chaos. I feel like for 15 points it's cheap enough to be usable on a Keeper of Secrets, but kind of unlikely to make any sort of huge difference in game. Might be an alright one to try and round off a list if you did have a few points left over, and a Keeper without the upgrade. Overall I'd say that all of these are usable enough on the Greater Demons, perhaps the Everstave in particular. It just kind of depends if you're running those models already. I don't feel like they add crazy amounts to the unit's power, but are just enough to be worth it. So that's the army and detachment rules. Before we get into data sheets, I thought it was just worth mentioning the allied rules for demons though. As mentioned, demons are just unusually easy to ally to the rest of the Chaos factions. And if you're playing one of the other Chaos armies, then the basic rule is that you can take one quarter of your points in allied demon data sheets. The only real restriction is that the god-specific legions can only take demons of their patron deity, 
so only corn for world eaters, for example. Nogal for Death Guard, Zinch for Thousand Sons, and if you're Warlords Lucius the Eternal for the Chaos Space Marines, then it's only Slanesh. That's not really the hardest restriction to sidestep, though. The data sheets will lose the Shadow of Chaos and its secondary benefits, perhaps the main downside being that they're not going to be getting close range deep strike for melee demons, but otherwise don't really lose anything else. For more common allied demon selections, the armies that can take them often quite like cheap options that can deep strike to do things like secondary objectives, which is often something that some of the other Chaos Legions lack somewhat. Random disruptive lone operatives like the Changeling and the Blue Scribes can often be handy to have in a list. Things that can't be shot outside of 12 inches can be hard to catch up with when they're dropping down into corners of the board doing secondaries. Flames of Zinch are quite a popular one as well, a little bit more expensive than they were, but they're just quite a cheap shooting unit for the demons. Quite nice for a mix of dropping to do objectives and clearing out some enemy troops, and maybe even threatening Overwatch. Nurglings, I think, are fairly godly for secondary objectives. Very cheap units that can infiltrate and deep strike. Nice screening options that the opponent really doesn't want to waste any time fighting if they can. And otherwise, just if any of the other demon data sheets are worth it to the faction to add just for raw strength, they can certainly pick one or two of them up. The greater demons tend to be okay for raw power. Celesque is really quite strong for the points between the range and melee damage and gets back up when they die. And skull cannons could be interesting enough for Chaos Knights, not really for inflicted damage, but for inflicting a fairly cheapish Battleshock test. Really quite nice with their army rules. On the flip side, the allies that the demons can take are just the Chaos Knights, perhaps tending to be a bit of a rarer pick for demon armies rather than it being allied out the other way around. Perhaps one of the most interesting things they're lacking in their roster could just be a bit of quality fire support. Wardog Brigands could definitely help out with that. I feel like there are a fair few other Chaos Knight data sheets that are just kind of strong that you might want in your army. Could just be nice to have some Wardogs moving forward to the midfield objectives, things like Dangerous Carnivores or Huntsman or Stalkers, fairly high objectives control, fairly fast movement and maybe a bit more of an anchor to advance around the list while demons do deep strike things. Getting into the meat of the index though, with the actual data sheets though, these are the ways that most of the demons are organised. There's six battle line units, blood letters, pink horrors, plague bearers and demonettes, and also blue horrors and nerglings. Most of the data sheets are arranged by deity and don't really have cross deity synergy of any sort. There's four undivided ones, Bellacor, the Soul Grinder and the Demon Princes. The Soul Grinders and Demon Princes have to take marks though. And at least currently there isn't really all that much drawn not to go for Chaos Undivided in 10th edition. You don't really lose any huge things at an army with wide level just for taking a mix of different gods demons. Though with some characters helping buff some of your units, some of them might encourage you to take some units in clusters if one unit could buff multiple other ones from the same deity. Otherwise, as mentioned briefly at the start, the demons have quite a lot of army trends. Everyone can deep strike, so you can put a lot of things in deep strike reserve, and most of the time that's a good thing to do, given that Warp Rifts allows you to get in there quite close. Between that and maybe using some judicious rapid ingress, you could make some big power plays. Leadership's typically 7 for the lesser demons, or 6 plus for the greater ones, means that they won't be all that reliable on the battle line if they're outside of your shadow of chaos. Most units tend to rely on their invulnerable saves, and these no longer vary from range to melee like they used to in 9th edition. The invulnerable saves do mean that high AP weapons of the enemy might not have as much value, though it does mean that cover saves aren't really going to be as important for demons. A few of them might be meaningful, but not that many. Broadly, the deities have their own themes. Corn generally has good AP and good damage on their melee weapons, a slightly better defence than Slanesh does. Slanesh has great movement and a high volume of attacks with a fair few devastating wounds but their units do genuinely seem to be very fragile. Nurgle has high toughness and wound counts, though fairly low damage output and quite slow. And Zinch comes with high invulnerable saves of a 4+, plus and has most of the ranged units of the detachment, though tends to be a bit weak to melee. Finally, quite a few units can take icons and instruments, which come for free now in 10th edition. Icons give your unit a plus 1 leadership, so often things like blood letters would be leadership 6+, plus, not 7. And instruments of chaos give you a plus 1 to charge as well, that means that when you're coming out of warp rifts, it might just be a 5-inch charge, not a 6. Really quite a nice thing to have for having your units make melee. Into the data sheets themselves though, and I'll try and go through at least fairly quick fire. Starting with Corn and the Cornate Battle Line of the Blood Letters. 14 points each and Toughness 4 with a 5 plus invulnerable save is a bit depressingly fragile, though they do hit at least fairly hard in combat with 2 attacks at Strength 5 and Damage 2. They do perhaps seem like one of the best units that will make good use of the Shadow of Chaos to get really close. Being slow and not all that tough means they get some pretty maximal value out of that. Their ability gives you a further damage buff, allowing you to re-roll once to wound. That goes up to 4 wound re-rolls if the enemy is below half strength, 
though that is kind of situational. Overall, I feel like they're definitely a bit less bad than they were when they were all the way up at 16 points, maybe just a little bit on the pricey side though. And being somewhat easy to kill does put a lot of pressure on them to deal damage off the Alpha Strike, ideally going into something like two wound Space Marines. The Cavalry Bloodletters are the Blood Crushers on their Juggernauts, four wounds at Toughness 7 with a 4 plus invulnerable save and a 10 inch move. For these ones, you get three of them for 120 points or six for 240. Compared with the Bloodletters, they swap out a whole bunch of their Hellblade attacks for, for a lot of attacks with the Juggernaut Bladed Horns. They hit on 4s with Strength 6, AP 1 and Lance, meaning that the units may be just a little bit more skewed to do killing lighter infantry compared with Space Marines, at least compared with their Foot Troop counterparts. They do get a nice damage boost with their Brass Stampede Special Rule, giving you D3 Mortal Wounds on each roll of a 4+, plus for units that finish up with an engagement range, and they get the same Icon and Instrument as their Foot Troops as well. I feel like after Blood Letters went down, these guys are somewhat well balanced with them. Maybe just a little bit less raw damage overall, though not by much if you can arrange them to get those mortal wounds off. And they are at least a little bit more resilient to small arms fire. For the Flesh Hounds, they're 70 points for 5 or 140 for 10. Two wounds at Toughness 4 with a 5 plus invulnerable save. And they move really quite fast with 12 inches and the Beast keyword. Perhaps one of the better units to start on the board and act as sort of outriders for the unit, jumping from cover to cover to try and avoid getting shot, and then going for some lighter enemy units that are taking objectives with their gore-drenched fangs. They get a 3 plus feel no pain against psychic attacks, and their special rule is a 0 CP heroic intervention, could allow them to help protect other demon units, but I feel like the heroic interventions that are free are kind of bad, as it's just very situational. Not too bad, but I wouldn't want too many of them. They can't really deal with heavy targets at all. The Skull Cannon got a fairly nice points cut down to 105 points in the digital index. It's a Toughness 9 big gun with a 4 plus invulnerable save and 9 wounds. The main cannon hits with D6 plus 2 attacks at strength 9, AP 1 and damage 2. A bit of a middling profile that's just kind of alright against everything, but not particularly exciting against any one thing. It can fight for itself a little bit in melee as well with a flurry of strength 5 or 6 attacks at damage 2. Its ability is to trigger Battle Shock, which I suppose could give you a chance of getting some extra mortal wounds if the enemy was in the Shadow of Chaos, but that is going to be a little bit on the unreliable side, even at the best of times. Interestingly, as mentioned earlier, I feel like it could be one of the most interesting units to ally to Chaos Knights, handing out a reliable Battle Shock test at range can be kind of handy for them with their abilities. Korn has a fortification, and that fortification is the Skull Altar. This one can infiltrate and be deployed in the mid-board if you'd like, and it's fairly tough with toughness 12, 10 wounds and a 3 plus save, though no invulnerable. Its main ability is to project the Shadow of Chaos, that means you probably want to set it up in the mid board somewhere where it could perhaps threaten a couple of different objectives, and you could have some close range deep strike threaten the units that were on them. As a bonus, Corn units also get two reroll Battleshock tests when they're nearby it, though I'd see that as a bit of an aside and not really the main ability. I genuinely think that this one isn't actually terrible, being able to guarantee to threaten Deep Strike on a couple of midfield points is really quite big, though at the same time seeing as it just doesn't really do anything else much, paying 105 points for it is a bit of a big ask. Onto the Cornate characters, and they're headed up by the Mighty Bloodthirster, 320 points, so went up a bit in the balanced data slate. Bloodthirsters are pretty enormously mighty, a big toughness 11 with a 4 plus and vulnerable save, and 18 wounds and bounce forward across the board with the fly keyword quite quickly at 12 inches in each movement phase. At range you get a Heavy Flamer style Hellfire Breath attack, and in combat you get to choose the option between the Axe of Corn and the Great Axe of Corn. Almost everyone I've seen generally tends to go for the Great Axe, as that one gives you a massive amount of sweep attacks at strength 10 and damage 2 for killing Space Marines, and a much better profile for killing heavies at strength 16 and a huge damage D6 plus 2. If you take the regular axe, then that's quite significantly diminished, but you do get a fun shooting attack on top of that, either a Lash of Corn or the Blood Flail. I'd certainly take the Great Axe myself though. Otherwise it gets an aura of plus one to hit for core units that will affect itself if it gets a negative debuff for any reason. And then if anything is still left after it's fought its attacks, at the end of the fight phase you get to roll a very fluffy 8d6 to please Corn, and for each 4+, plus, the enemy takes a further mortal wound. That's some pretty considerable damage just in itself to try and finish off the last enemy units. 
I still think he's good at 320 points despite the points increase. He does have the movement to start on the board if he wants to, maybe alongside Bellacor to cover him from shooting, or could be a fun unit to either rapid ingress or deep strike with Shadow. Argath King of Blaze does seem pretty powerful on him as well. Even if you're getting an extra one or two attacks on that Great Axe, that's going to add up to a lot more damage. For 345 points, Scarbrand has gone down a little bit from his initial points cost. He is a 20 wound bloodthirster without wings that only moves 8 inches. And his axes, Slaughter and Carnage, are somewhat equivalent to the great axe of the previous Bloodthirster. Slight side grades on the damage profiles, but fairly similar overall. He gets a slightly improved Torrent Flamer called Bellow of Endless Fury, though it doesn't get AP. His aura gives you a plus one attack aura for corn units. This one excludes monsters and vehicles though, and in general that's going to be a much better buff for Bloodletters at least. Going from two attacks to three attacks on those Hellblades is quite a big deal. Finally, he has a chance to keep the enemy units in combat with him if they're within 6 inches. They have to take a leadership test, and if they fail, they must remain stationary instead of fall back. That could be really big and disruptive if it goes off. It's just as ever with Battleshock a bit of a coin flip. Sometimes it could be really annoying for your opponent and basically doom a unit that he's managed to tag after killing a second one. Other times, they can just walk away normally. I think he's definitely a lot better balanced with the other Bloodthirster, now he's gone down in points a bit, though I'd still probably be more tempted by the generic data sheet with all those mortal wounds and things. For the Cornate Herald, the Bloodmaster has 75 points, who can lead the Bloodletters. He's for 4 Wound Demon Herald, that gets a perhaps surprisingly punchy Hellblade. The Blade of Blood is Strength 6, AP 2 and Damage 3, with a big 5 attacks. That's a pretty nasty profile against Terminators and things. His main big buff is that he gives you a plus one to wound roll with those Hellblades. That could definitely make them punch up a lot better against hard targets than having to wound them on fives or sixes. And he also helps out with a bigger consolidate as well. Often that won't be much use, but when it is, it could be big. Piling into another unit or being able to snag an objective. Overall seems pretty usable if you just want to double down on massive melee from a bloodletter unit. I think his buff is worth it for the 75 points, particularly with the big attacks that he gets. But you may be making a unit that's even more of a glass cannon. Very, very dangerous, but he doesn't really add much durability to the squad. The Skullmaster is the Cornate Herald on Juggernaut for 105 points. He can only lead the Blood Crushers and has a Juggernaut style profile with its toughness 7, but he gets to go up to 6 wounds instead. He gets the same Blade of Blood attacks as the regular Herald, plus the bonus attacks from the Juggernaut horns, the same as the Blood Crushers get. And his main boost to the unit is that he gives Juggernaut bladed horns devastating wounds on the charge. That perhaps sounds okay, and it might help out against hard targets a little bit, but in reality, even on a maxed out squad with his attacks included, that's usually only going to add up to something like around about 3 devastating wounds. It's not really all that spectacular, not compared with buffing the squad's base damage. His other rules are Battleshock and Engagement Range type rule, that usually tends to be pretty awful, and overall he just seems a bit passable really. The damage 3 blade is okay, and the devastating wounds add a little, but he doesn't really add much that adding more blood crushers wouldn't really. For 150 points, we have the Cornate Chariot that is the Ren Master on Blood Throne. This one has got a similar sort of profile to the Skull Cannon as it's a dual build from the same model. 9 wounds and a 4 plus invulnerable save at toughness 9. For its main damage, you get the Attendant's Hellblades with 4 strength 5 and damage 2 attacks, plus a Blade of Blood like the other Cornate Heralds. And the Blood Throne's particularly nasty against characters, re rolling wound rolls against them and against monsters as well. Perhaps the really good thing about this guy though is that you get a big buff for one Cornate melee in the board. You get to nominate him in the fight phase which is kind of helpful. Nominate one enemy unit that's within 18 inches of him and each time a Corn Legion's Demonica unit attacks that unit you get to improve their strength, AP and damage characteristics of their attack by one. Really quite serious stuff for a whole load of profiles. You could have a Bloodthirster sweep profile go up to damage 3 and be utterly ruinous against Terminators. Or have strength 6, AP 3 and damage 3 Hellblades for Bloodletters, which again is absolutely crazy. Overall, I feel like between that buff and its damage output, it definitely can be worth it. The biggest issue is keeping it safe though, it just doesn't really have all that impressive a defensive profile, and it would be sensible for the opponent to try and gun this down pretty quickly, as it's not really that hard to kill. Lastly for Korn, we've got a couple of epic heroes. Skull Takers 95 points and these Bloodletters. Similar sort of stats to the Herald on foot, but 5 wounds instead. His Blade of Blood picks up devastating wounds and gets 6 attacks rather than 5, and they all get precision as well, so quite nice for slaying enemy champions there. And he also buffs the units to give their Hellblades all devastating wounds as well, nice if they're punching up against a harder target. Finally, each time he attacks a character, he gets to re-roll the hit and wound roll, and if you kill any characters then you gain 1 CP. 
That is fairly scary with those amount of quality attacks with damage 3 there. He's got a really strong chance to kill enemy unit champions if he gets into them. Again, perhaps a similar sort of deal with the Blobmaster. Adds a lot of damage to the units, though no real defence. So basically makes them even more fragile for the points, but even more dangerous. Finally, we've got Karanak for 75 points, who's dropped 10. He's the triple-headed Cerberus thing that leads the Flesh Hounds. 5 wounds with a 4 plus invulnerable save. Though his soul rending fangs are quite a bit weaker than a bunch of the other heralds, his 6 attacks strike at strength 6, AP 1 and damage 2. His special rules allow you to re-roll advance and charge rolls for the flesh hounds, helps a little bit with mobility there I suppose. And at the start of the game you get to choose a target to be its prey, you get lethal hits with the unit's weapons against it. If that prey should be destroyed by any reason, he gets to nominate a new one, the next most likely thing that they're going to be tangling with. I think for 75 points he's not awful, he makes Flesh Hounds into a bit more of a serious skirmishing threat that could kill things like small 5 man units of Space Marines and similar. I'd certainly be weighing him up against taking just more units of Flesh Hounds though, as for these screening and skirmishing type units it might just be better to have two different units controlling two different parts of the board than one extra good one. Zinch next and for the core of their battle line we've got the Pink Horrors. 10 models for 140 points, strength 3 with a 4 plus invulnerable save, so perhaps surprisingly hard to kill for lesser demons perhaps, and striking with their coruscating flames, 2 attacks hitting on a 3 plus at strength 4, AP 1 and damage 1, good enough to chew through enemy infantry units with a bit of time. Demon shooting units, even ones that are quite skewed to infantry, are a bit of a rarity as well, and do work quite nicely with their deep strike type rules. The big thing with Pink Horrors though is that they're just spectacularly durable due to split, provided the unit doesn't get just wiped out in one enormous attack from one enemy unit with a whole bunch of anti-infantry fire. If there's at least one model surviving in the unit, then any destroyed ones can roll to see if they split. On a 4 plus each Pink Horror splits into two Blue Horrors and they get added to the unit, and on a 4 plus each Blue Horror generates one Brimstone Horror base. And they're all equally hard to kill again with Toughness 3 and that same 4 plus invulnerable save, including the lesser ones. It means that in theory land, if you kill the model just bit by bit on one model at a time, you need to kill on average 25 models to wipe out the entire unit, and that's going to be really quite a chore when they've all got a 4 plus invulnerable save. In reality, you're probably going to lose the last few of them in a single burst, so splits prevent it. But at least most units won't be wiping them out in just one go straight away. You're almost certainly going to get a fair few splitting horrors. I think these things are really quite interesting as skirmishy type units to hold objectives and just annoy the enemy and get in their way. Maybe do things like 3 inch deep strikes with their big objective control. They're not really going to be the unit that's doing the most damage in the world though. Only really good for killing toughness 3 things with medium saves. Maybe doing a bit of damage to toughness 4 space marines as a push. The other Zinch battle line data sheet is the Blue Horrors. This is the one where you just start with 10 Blue Horrors, and then they have the option to split into Brimstone Horrors down the line. These are 125 points, so they aren't really all that much less than the Pink Horrors, given that you'll likely get a whole bunch of Blues from just splitting Pinks in the first place. And I feel like with that kind of points difference, it's probably worth going for the Pinks almost all the time. Units of blues alone get worse damage output with only strength 3 flames hitting on a 4 plus and also are only leadership 8 as well which doesn't help loads. Though to make up for that they do have a couple of fun things, a nearby leadership debuff of 1 and the option to try and suicide your brimstone horrors. For each one you elect then the enemy suffers one mortal wound on the roll of a 4 plus but the brimstone horror is destroyed either way. The real reason that you might be tempted to take these is perhaps because they infiltrate though, means they can actually set up in the mid board and could be an alternative to Nurglings with that given that these guys actually have some objective control, so that is definitely a positive. Could be okay if you want to pay a bit of a premium for that privilege. I feel like I'd generally be more tempted by Nurglings though for doing infiltrate things even if they don't have objective control. Next up we've got the Flamers of Zinj. 3 to 6 models for either 80 points or 160. These guys went up by 15 points from the balance update as they were sort of auto include for quite a lot of chaos factions, dropping down, doing secondaries and things, flaming away at enemy infantry. They were very, very popular picks in core demon lists as well. Stats wise, they've got 3 wounds at toughness 4 and move 9 inches with fly, and their flamethrowers are flickering flames that strike with d6 auto hits at strength 4, AP minus 1. Again, mainly good for killing light infantry rather than anything heavier, though they could threaten a pretty scary overwatch in the right circumstances. They can charge when they fall back as well, which is quite nice given that they're going to be getting in close and they might get tagged. I still think they're definitely playable at 80 points, just being a cheap unit with a small footprint and some okay range damage dealing. It's probably enough to have them across the line for a sort of utility unit type pick, 
jumping around with Shadow in the warp and doing secondaries and killing outlying enemy troops. I'd be more tempted to use them that way than any sort of masked up actual main damage dealer type unit though. While we're on the flamers, I thought it might be worth just jumping ahead to the Exalted Flamer slightly before going back to other more battle line things. The Exalted Flamer's 70 points, so slightly less than a unit of 3 flamers. He's got 6 wounds and a 4 plus invulnerable save, and strikes with either a 2d6 torrent with a heavy flamer sort of profile at strength 5 AP 1, or some big hitting blue fire attacks with strength 9 AP 3 and damage 3, okay for blasting a few elites I suppose. His attacks get 2 slower unit on a roll of a 4 plus, and if he's leading flamers around, then he gives them the assault keyword as well. That could be quite nice to get those flames in range if they were starting on the board. Overall, I think he seems okay. He does make the unit a bit more general purpose with that choice of fire. And maybe isn't too far away from being kind of efficient enough to be run individually. Would we'll probably need to be just a few points less to be more tempting there though. If you were set on running a big squad of six flamers, then he could definitely consider it. I feel like for the most part, I'd be more tempted to keep them in units of three though. Next up we've got the Screamers, 80 points for 3 or 160 points for 6 of them, very fast moving Zinch melee creations these, a similar sort of defensive profile to the Flamers, at 3 wounds, toughness 4 and their 4 plus invulnerable save. In combat their Lamprey Bite strikes with 3 attacks at strength 6, AP 2 and damage 2, and they've got a slashing attack that they can do in the movement phase as they pass by an enemy unit for mortal wounds. Again they're perhaps another unit that I'd see more of as a utility unit than anything else, 14 inch movement with fly is really quite massive, particularly with being beasts so they interact quite well with terrain. They've got enough melee threat to be able to damage small units of space marines or other lighter infantry, and could be quite nice for screening, doing secondary objectives or charging things that don't really want to be charged. Burning chariots have got a fair bit cheaper at 115 points now, a really big 20 point drop from where they were before and they're looking a lot more balanced. They've got 9 wounds at toughness 8 with the 4 plus invulnerable save, and the same damage profile as the Exalted Flamers have. And the special rule for this guy is that he strips cover from the unit that got hit by a shooting attack. Maybe not terrible, but at the same time it's not relevant for Flamers, and Chaos Demons don't really have all that much other shooting. I guess it could help out Horrors or the Lord of Change, I suppose. It is fairly fast with a 12 inch movement, and has some okay combat with some Screamer style melee attacks, plus the Flamer mouths. I think at its new points it is kind of usable, could still threaten some fairly nasty overwatch with the Torrent as well. For 260 points, there's the Lord of Change, which went up 30 in the last data slate. The Greater Demon of Zinch, this one's toughness 10 and 18 wounds with a 4 plus invulnerable, and moves across the board 12 inches. It could be quite a nice one for returning to reserves and then deep striking each turn that it can to get some line of sight on things that opponents wouldn't like them to. It gets quite a big equipment choice, either between a Baleful Sword or a Rod of Sorcery. This one gives it a lot better damage either at range or at melee. I think I would overall be a bit more tempted by the Rod of Sorcery for extra shooting attacks and then give it the Everstave for a little bit of extra strength on those shooting attacks. With the Rod he could be firing out around about 15 attacks with strength 8 or 9, AP 1 or 2 and damage D3, perhaps better with the Everstave as well. And he gets to choose to amp up that damage with either ignores cover, lethal hits or sustained hits D3, that's applying to the Bolt of Change only with the 9 shots. His special rule helps out Zinch shooting a little, so he could be having strength 5 horror shots or strength 5 flamers, and it would make its own shooting into strength 9 or 10, even better with the Everstave. Overall I think it's okay, a fairly nice general purpose damage output with a lot of fairly high strength shots between the buff and the stave. Quite a nice unit to potentially jump around the board with the return to reserve stratagem if it finds itself out of combat. Kairos Fate Weaver is the Zinch Lord of Change, 285 points for a 20 wound one. And he trades out those 15 shots at range for usually around 8 attacks with his Infernal Gateway, though with that he gets better AP and can fire them out of line of sight as well with indirect fire. Overall his melee is a fair bit better as well as it goes up to a big damage 2d3. Beyond that, Fate Weaver gets to help out with command points quite a lot. You get to increase one stratagem by one CP for the opponent, now a battle tactic so maybe the command point reroll if nothing else. And he can help out by farming some command points if you spend CP on Zinch Demons within 6 inches of him. An interesting mechanic where you've got better chance to farm the command points the earlier that you use them in the game. That probably is the better way around to be honest. Overall I think he's interesting enough to have in the centre of your army and he can definitely be pretty threatening with the indirect fire. 285 points does seem like at least quite a lot for him though. He definitely doesn't tend to be one of the most run greater demons in competitive lists. 
For 65 points, there's the Changecaster, who can lead either the pink or blue horrors. He chips in with a bit of range damage with an arcane fireball, three shots at strength 6, AP 2, and damage D3 if he rolls hazardous, though that is a bit of a risk given that he's only got three wounds to start with. Might just give you a slightly disappointing chance of exploding it into a ball of magical flames. His main boost is giving you sustained hits 1 of 4 horrors, so slightly amping up their shooting along with his own attacks, and his secondary ability is handing out battle shock tests. I feel like the sustained hits one just isn't really all that exciting for horror shooting. It's not terrible, but it's a unit with a kind of weedy damage output already. I think in general I'd be more tempted to run squads of horrors without change casters than ones with. For 60 points we've got the Flux Master, the Zinch Herald on the disc. He can lead either pink horrors or blue horrors again, and has kind of similar stats to the other one but with 4 wounds, so he can maybe be a bit more risky with using his Hazardous Fireball. And he also gets a better movement as well, though he is going to be limited by the pace of the horrors. His boost is that he makes the units a minus one to hit, so it could be nice for an extra durable horror block I suppose. And he gets a small damage or defense boost, allowing you to change a wound roll to a six, which could be quite nice with the fireball's devastating wounds. Overall maybe not too bad for a slightly tankier horror squad, it's got a bit more of a sting in the tail with a near guaranteed devastating wound d3 attack each turn. Again though, maybe just not adding a whole load compared with just putting those points towards more horrors or other units. For 105 points, there's the Fate Skimmer. Here's the Zinch Herald on the Chariot, kind of similar to the Burning Chariot. Toughness 7, 9 wounds and a 4 plus invulnerable save, and he could have him run individually or lead some Screamers. If he's leading a Screamer squad, then he gives them lethal hits, which could be nice for the Lamprey Bites to strike up against Tough Stuff. He has a fair few Screamer attacks in combat himself, and also chips in with fireballs the same as the rest of the heralds. He does count as a mounted character though, as opposed to a beast character, and that could mean that the screamer unit would interact a lot worse with terrain than if they just had beast models there. Finally, his special rule is Rider of the Immaterial Winds. Once for battle, you can disappear him at the end of the opponent's turn and put him back into strategic reserve. Could be a fun redeploy to get him somewhere else on the board and threaten units that didn't want to be threatened. Sort of like a built-in version of that Return to the Warp style stratagem. Overall, he definitely makes Screamers into a more threatening unit. I sort of feel like he's trying to make them play in a way that they're not really designed to that much though. Making them more of a mainline battle line type threat as opposed to units that hide around and pounce on more isolated stuff with their massive movement. I'm just not sure if they're quite cheap enough for that compared with other options. Finally for Zinch, we've got a couple of Trixie Lone Operative special characters. The blue stripes are 65 points and tend to be quite a common include in competitive lists, though for the most part they don't really tend to actually do all that much, rather than just be a lone operative that can move really quite quickly, and is at least somewhat tough with toughness for 6 wounds and the 4 plus invulnerable save. Just having a lone operative unit on the board to deep strike somewhere, do secondary objectives, and then be an annoying threat that the opponent has to move out of position to try and deal with though, just adds quite a lot of value by itself, and for that reason they're quite often seen as an allied choice. For their actual abilities, their melee just doesn't do very much because they hit on fives. They've got a situational sort of psychic debuff where it means that psychic weapons are minus one to wound if they're within 12 of this model, which I guess could be handy against the right army. And perhaps a slightly more exciting ability is that they can throw out a whole bunch of random mortal wounds to units within six inches at the end of their movement phase. Just one on a one to three, D3 on a four to five, or a big D6 on a six. Theoretically that could lead to at least a fair bit of damage if you could get several different units in range, though it would be kind of scattergun and chip damage, and they'd quite likely die to the counter attack after. I'd see that perhaps as more of a bonus though, that they could try and sort of suicide towards an enemy unit if it made sense, or potentially even just have a small chance of killing something isolated that would have almost no life left. The other fairly common lone operative included in more competitive lists is the Changeling. Zinch's shapeshifter is 90 points and has gone up a bit in the balance updates. He's toughness 3 with 5 wounds and a 4 plus invulnerable. Has lone operative and the stealth keyword. Again he's handy just for being a tiny model that can jump into nice places and score points on the secondary objectives. But beyond that he does bring maybe a bit more value than the blue scribes. A fairly nice flamethrower type attack with strength 6, AP 1 and damage D3. And then two different damage debuffs, if the enemy tries to attack him, then if they fail a battle shock test, then they can't, so it means that he could survive a turn unexpectedly from time to time. And he can also mess with enemy shooting as well, nominate an enemy unit within 12 inches in their shooting phase, and usually give them a minus one to hit. Every so often it could be a kind of devastating can't shoot at all though. If you got lucky with that, with a very powerful gunline unit, it could be really game changing. 
Moving on to Nurgle, and first up we have the Playbearers, 10 models for 125 points, coming down very significantly since the initial rules dropped for 10th edition. I think these guys have moved to being fairly usable for objective holders now. A toughness 5 with 2 wounds apiece and a 5 plus invulnerable save. That is going to be a slog to get through for most units for this kind of points. And I've got good objective control at OC2, plus the icon and instrument so they're a bit less likely to fail leadership than most. They come with the sticky objectives type rule locked in which is handy enough to have around. And their attacks are with plague swords with lethal hits at strength 4 and AP minus 1. Will almost certainly to a few wounds off the enemy each turn but again their damage output just isn't really all that good. Perhaps some of the most truly god tier type units in Chaos Demons though are Nurglings. The smallest of the demons are definitely very handy to have in the army. 35 points for a squad of 3 of them, getting you 3 models with toughness 3, 4 wounds and a 6 plus invulnerable save. 12 wounds on the table for just that small points cost is going to be annoying for quite a lot of units to have to deal with with focus fire. They don't really do any meaningful damage, but that's not really their point. They can infiltrate forward into the midboard and screen or move block if it makes sense to. Or you can potentially put them in deep strike reserve and have them drop down to do secondary objectives with a really cheap and expendable unit. As an added bonus, if the enemy gets too close to them, they can give them a minus one to hit. That could be really annoying for units trying to clear them out in melee, and occasionally could be quite a big debuff for more serious enemy threats if they had to try and move up in and around the Nurglings. I'd say that these guys are borderline also include territory for Chaos Demons at this kind of cost. I feel like somewhere between 1-3 to three units is almost certainly going to give you a small leg up in scoring for the game. Next up we've got the Fly Riding Plague Drones. 3-6 to six models for either 120 or 240 points. Kind of like Plague Bearers with a bit faster and damage 2 attacks. Tanky Cavalry at Toughness 8, 5 wounds and they're 5 plus and vulnerable. I still feel like their melee is probably not all that much to write home about but they do have a fairly powerful buffing rule in their death heads that they fire out in the shooting phase with a few small plague style attacks. You get to select one enemy unit that was hit by these death heads and then you get to reroll wound rolls with the rest of your Nurgle army against that unit for the rest of the turn. Makes the damage into the target they charge go off just a bit better but might be more value if marking targets for something like a great unclean one maybe. I still think they may be a bit on the pricey side for 120 points, probably one of the units that could have afforded to go down a bit I think. Next up, the Beasts of Nurgle are 70 points each, and you can either have one or two of them in a unit. They're again very tanky, with toughness 9 and 7 wounds. Kind of similar sort of durability compared with the Plague Drones, and again they get a bunch of damage to attack in melee. One of the few Nurgle things that doesn't get lethal hits, but they do get devastating wounds instead with those putrid appendages. These guys can just be really annoying in the right situation though, as at the end of each phase they basically just heal back up to full health if they've lost any wounds. It means that you can't kill the models over multiple phases if the enemy had units that just wanted to do chip damage against them. It could be kind of powerful if they could be scrapping over more isolated objectives where the opponent can't bring loads of force to bear on them. It'd be pretty depressing if a unit killed quite a lot of stuff off the unit but you got a bit lucky with some invulnerable saves and then they just healed up promptly to full health again. Definitely units that might give your opponent some problems to solve. For the Nurgle fortification there's the Feculent Narmor. 100 points for a tree that can be put down in the midboard. It gives cover saves like regular cover does, and then it also gives an aura of stealth to Nurgle demons within 6 inches of it. If anything though, this one's maybe just a little bit too easy to kill. Toughness 9, 9 wounds and a 4 plus save just is a bad defensive profile for 100 points. Kind of surprisingly so among the Nurgle units, it just feels a bit mediocre for the defense it adds as well, compared with just adding more durable units that can be at least somewhat threatening to. For 250 points, there's the Great Unclean one. He got a fairly big points cut compared with the other Greaters in the last update. Previously, he was very rarely taken. Now, it seems to be cheap enough to be making it into competitive lists. He's basically a big, tanky, tough anvil of a Greater Demon. 20 wounds at toughness 12 with a 4 plus invulnerable save. And he'll also have a 6 plus fail no pain as well from his aura that he gives to nearby Nurgle Demons. Otherwise he gets a couple of war gear choices, he can choose either a plague flail or a bile blade depending on whether he wants a bit of attack at range or some more attacks in melee, I'd be more tempted by the plague flail overall I think. And then a bile sword versus the doomsday bell, I feel like the bile sword would be my preference there. Given that it's quite a lot better in melee, I feel like restoring a dead plague bearer just isn't really quite worth it to give up that. The Feel No Pain buff is quite good for nearby Nurgle, and he can debuff one enemy unit for minus one toughness as well within 12 inches, occasionally that could be helpful. 
is a pretty reasonable one to have the 5 plus feel no pain enhancement on, going up to a 4 plus in Shadow of the Warp. Overall quite nice for just an enormous great big annoying threat to slog his way towards the midfield objectives and cause the opponent's problems trying to deal with him. Again he isn't the most enormous damage dealer for his points, but he should still be able to handle most medium sized units between his range and melee. The character equivalent of the Great Unclean one is Rotigus. He's 260 points, so has gone down 25. A 22 wound Great Unclean one, so a little bit tougher there. Though overall, he will be a little bit less tough than the regular Great Unclean one, given that he doesn't get the feel no pain. He gets a slightly improved vomit attack with his streams of brackish filth and has a fairly powerful null rod strike. He gets 7 strength 8 attacks at damage 3. His special rules are to half the move and objective control characteristics of units within 6 inches. That could be annoying to have in the midboard on one of the central objectives. And his virulent blessing means that one Nurgle Demon's unit within 18 inches of him gets minus one damage in the fight phase. That could target him as well, will make him extra resilient towards damage two attacks, though a bit less powerful than something like the 5 plus feel no pain if you took the enhancement on the other one. Overall I'd say that he's got fairly similar value overall to the more standard great unclean one, though I think I'd be slightly more tempted by the standard one over him. Otherwise, running through the Nurgle Heralds, we've got the Pox Springer for 65 points. He leads Plague Bearers and he's got a fairly tanky profile himself with 5 wounds at T5. He also comes with a 5 plus feel no pain. He brings a little bit of actually serious melee threat to the unit with 4 attacks at strength 5 and damage 2 with lethal hits. It would definitely make them a bit more of a serious threat against Space Marines and the like. And he also means that they make a few more mortal wounds with their attacks, getting 5 pluses to critical hits with their lethal hit attacks. Not terrible for a slightly more threatening Plague Bearer unit there. Again, might kind of be at odds with what they really want to do though, which is be a fairly cheap unit with a bunch of objective control. With their slow movements, they're not really going to have the choice of melee combats they get to fight in. They're just going to have to try and deal with what they've got. And they're certainly not getting to be a standout dangerous melee unit even with this buff. Otherwise, for the Nurgle Heralds, there's the Sloppity Bile Piper for 55 points. He's got similar durability with the 5 wounds, but no feel, no pain. His weapon's a lot less good in combat, and then he has two buffs, making Plague Bearers move a little bit faster, and throwing out Battleshock tests to enemies in the fight phase. Really not good for 55 points, I think. I'd definitely be a bit more tempted with the damage output buff of the Poxbringer, and even then I feel like he's a bit questionable compared with just running Plague Bearers without upgrades. Next we've got the Spoilpot Scrivener with 65 points with his big mouth. He's sort of medium damage output in combat between the Spoilpox and the regular Poxbringer with strength 5 and AP 1 attacks, plus he gets a small torrent with his disgusting sneezes. He gives the Plague Bearer sustained hits 1, which would make 6s quite valuable between that and the lethal hits, and he also gives you plus 1 to the objective control of your unit. That definitely does help out the Plague Bearers with their primary purpose. Again, kind of okay, maybe a bit of a side grade compared with just buying more Plague Bearers and putting the points towards another unit. His damage buff is less good than the Poxbringer, but the extra objective control could be kind of nice. Even if just a few remaining Plague Bearers hold a midfield objective, then they're going to have a lot of objective control points. Finally, for the named characters of Nurgle, we've got Epidemius, who's 85 points. He's a similar profile to the other Heralds, though gets 8 wounds rather than 5, so is a little bit tankier. And he also has better melee as well, d6 plus 3 attacks at strength 5, ap2 and damage 2. His buff is to give the unit a 4 plus invulnerable save, and as you kill enemy units he keeps a tally of models destroyed by Nurgle Demonica units. If in the command phase the tally has reached 7 or more, it gets reset and he generates you a command point. Overall I think he's at least fairly good value. The durability boost for a 4 plus invulnerable save is kind of big on a unit that's tanky already. He does help out in melee a little bit, and provided you're playing at least a fairly Nurgle heavy list, you're hopefully going to be able to generate at least a couple of command points over the game with that, though they might come a little bit later on than you might like. Seems kind of fine for the combined offering, but definitely doesn't seem auto include. Lastly for Nurgle, for 120 points we've got Horticulus Slimux, the great Nurgle farmer demon riding a snail. He's at least fairly durable in his own rights, having toughness 10, so the same toughness as a battle tank, a 4 plus invulnerable save and 10 wounds. You don't necessarily need to run him in a unit if you don't want to. In combat he's got 6 attacks total, all at damage 3 and sort of mid strength and AP. Not too bad for tangling with enemy elite infantry if you get into them. And his main buff is to corrupt a piece of terrain and make it part of your shadow of chaos. He can do that if at the end of your movement phase he's touching a piece of area terrain. 
He can make the apes be counting as in the shadow of chaos until the end of the rest of the battle. I feel like for that ability it is kind of fun. That could genuinely be an annoying way to deliver some units right close to the enemy. And you'd also have the option of having him lead Beast of Nurgle as well, giving them reroll charges and a 0 CP heroic intervention. I'm not really the most convinced by the Beast buffs, but I suppose with three models in the units, they would be able to handle most normal sized enemy units that came across them. They would have a fair amount of attacks there. Moving on to Slanesh, and for 120 points we have the Demonettes. They went down a lot from 140 to 120. They still don't seem to have reached the point where they're being run competitively very much. They definitely do have some interesting things. They move 9 inches, have objective control 2, and then get a whole bunch of attacks with strength 4 and devastating wounds that you get to re-roll the wound rolls against if the enemy is on an objective marker. Means that for a squad of 30, you could expect somewhere around the 5 or 6 mortal wound sort of mark, and they should have a good chance of making a charge at quite a long distance. Compared with a lot of the other demons though, they're still just very very fragile. Toughness 3 and only a 5 plus invulnerable save isn't that much for 12 points. And even with the devastating wounds, they're not going to be the strongest unit against really hard targets. Next up, we've got the Fiends, and they're 130 for 3 of them, or 260 for 6, coming down quite significantly from what they were before. Though again, probably still on the pricier side, to the extent where I feel like most of the other units are a little bit stronger. As ever with Slanesh, they do move very, very fast, 12 inch movement, and 4 wounds at toughness 5 with a 5 plus invulnerable save, getting a minus 1 to hit if you're within 6 inches of them. In combat, compared with the Demonettes, they're going to be a lot better at killing things like Space Marines. 15 attacks for a unit of 3 of them with Strength 5, AP 2 and Damage 2, again all with devastating wounds. Might be in a similar sort of position though, where they'll be able to handle themselves pretty well against medium or maybe even heavy infantry. But they'll struggle if they have to try and take down a vehicle despite costing quite a lot, and again not really being very tough for the cost. I feel like they could probably afford to go down a few more points. Even faster than the previous two are the Seekers for 85 points for 5 of them or 170 points for 10. They've got 2 wounds at toughness 4 with a 5 plus invulnerable save. I'd probably argue that that's a little bit better than the Demonettes overall per point durability surprisingly despite being really fast. The Seekers can very easily just threaten first turn charges. They get scouts 9 inches so could go towards the enemy with that if you had first turn. Then they move 14 inches so they've already moved 23 inches before the opponents even got to react. And then their special rule is allowing them to re-roll advance and charges. That usually means they've got around about a 23 inch threat range even before you account for their scout move. When they get there they fight with the power of half a demonette squad plus a few extra tongue attacks from their steegs. That the demonette should be pretty brutal against lighter infantry though struggle against heavier things. Overall I feel like with their scout move they're a fairly good utility unit now they're at this cost. They could make some very annoying plays right from the start of the game, potentially even doing things like fairly horrendous move blocks on enemy armies stretching out their bases as much as possible. They could cover quite a bit of the table that way and keep a lot of the enemy army locked in their own deployment zone on turn 1. Then we've got a lot of different variants of Slanesh chariots. The base one is the standard Seeker chariot, moving at a big 14 inches with 7 wounds at toughness 6 with a 4 plus invulnerable. This one coming at 75 points for one of them, or 150 for two. The whip attacks get them six attacks with anti-infantry at six inch range, and then they have 13 attacks overall at strength four in melee. Overall kind of similar to a squad of seekers, but on one more durable model as opposed to a lot of them. And they do also pick up the anti-infantry four plus ability if they make a charge. Again, maybe an interesting enough outrider type unit that could just be there to slow the enemy down. If you get lucky with some 4 plus invulnerable saves, and that could be quite a frustrating unit to try and play around. But for the most part, I feel like I'd prefer the Seekers compared with the Chariots. They have quite a few more attacks overall, and that scout move is rather big. Otherwise, for the different Chariots, we've got the Exalted Chariot at 115 points. This comes with 5 extra wounds, quite a lot more hits in melee at 22 hits overall. Though unfortunately, its fight phase ability is a battle shock test. The Hellflare is 105 points, so sort of midway between the two. This one's extra fragile for the cost at only the same profile as the standard Seeker Chariot, but it does come with a bit more damage for your points, with an extra blazed axle with 6 attacks at strength 6 and damage 2, plus some mortal wound impact hits, potentially quite a lot of them if it manages to charge some infantry. If you can guarantee that you can deliver it to combat, it could certainly make a mess of something that's infantry. Quite likely to die fairly easy to the counter-attack though. Lastly for the chariots, we've got the Torment Bringer on the Exalted Seeker Chariot. They're 140 points, so a little bit cheaper than they used to be. 
and kind of like an extra 25 points upgrade on a regular Exalted Chariot, having the same defence. The weapons that it gets are really quite similar to the Exalted Chariot, but it gives you an aura of sustained hits 1, 2 Slanesh Demons if you can coordinate a charge nearby, and also fairly interestingly it gives fights on death to a unit within 6 inches of itself, that one's a fairly powerful one if you'd just done a bunch of melee and were about to get countercharged, could allow some demonettes to drag down a bunch of the enemy with them or something. I'd say there's some okay buffs, but maybe a little bit hard to coordinate with vehicle models that want to be charging into combat, and as ever, the issue of mainly threatening infantry and not really being all that tough for the cost. Overall, I feel like the chariots are either just a little bit overcosted or just do a little bit less than you might hope for. Moving on to the other Slanesh characters though, and starting out we've got the Keeper of Secrets, the Greater Demon of the faction, 330 points, a 14 inch move and 18 wounds, and comes with the Phantasmagoria Psyche attack with 9 attacks at strength 6, AP 2 and damage 1, and then a bunch of damage 2 and 3 attacks in close combat. As an addition to its standard attacks, you get the choice of either the Whip, Knife or Aegis. The Whip gives you a little bit of close range shooting and actually quite good ones with strength 6, AP 1 and damage 2. The knife a little bit of slightly lacklustre melee, though I feel like the Shining Aegis is the one that most people would want to go for. That gives you a 5 plus feel no pain type save, which is kind of massive seeing as it effectively gives you an extra 50% durability. Very good on an 18 wound toughness 10 monster with an invul. Otherwise the Keeper gives you an aura of extra AP for nearby Slanesh demons, and the mesmerising form special rule means that enemies are minus 1 to hit when they target the Keeper of Secrets. It is kind of surprising that the Keeper is perhaps one of the more durable out of the Greater Demons, both a minus 1 to hit, and a 5 plus feel no pain is a little bit surprising. The main issue is perhaps that it just won't really be very good against anything that's particularly tough. The attacks are all either strength 6 or strength 8, so only really good for killing elite infantry as opposed to things like tanks and vehicles. Perhaps far more of a common sight in competitive demon lists than the regular Keeper is Shalaxi Hellbane. The named Keeper of Secrets is now an absolutely whopping 450 points, so a price tag higher than some Imperial Knights. It went up 50 points from the 400 it was before, but still seems to be seeing some good competitive play despite that, mainly just because it seems to kill just about everything in close combat really quite easily, particularly big tanks and vehicles. The profile is really quite similar to the regular Keeper of Secrets, they've got the Shining Aegis built in but have 20 wounds though no minus 1 to hit. Instead of that you get a fight phase debuff subtracting 1 from an enemy unit's attacks. Otherwise they've got a fair bit of shooting that's pretty good at handling medium infantry, but swap out the Witsteel Thord of the standard Keeper of Secrets for the murderously dangerous Soul Piercer Spear, 6 attacks at strength 14, AP 3 and damage D6 plus 2, and if you happen to be against a monster vehicle or character unit, you get to re-roll the hit roll, the wound roll and the damage roll, just giving you some absolutely ridiculous reliability. You might often convert 5 or 6 of these attacks into successful wounds, they're going to be at AP minus 3, and then with D6 plus 2 re-rolling the D6, you're going to cause a load of damage on big targets. Overall, utterly devastating, could be a unit to shield from enemy shooting with Bellacore, or deliver with the Shadow of Chaos somehow. Then for the other Slaneshi characters, we've got the Trance Weaver at 60 points, a 3 wound herald that adds a few more ravaging claws, devastating wounds attacks, the same as the regular ones. She gives the demonettes fights first though, which could be pretty big if you're fighting any sort of melee army means that some units that otherwise might have just wouldn't be able to charge the demonettes, which is quite a big thing. And her secondary ability is the chance to re-roll some wound rolls against a unit that fails Battleshock nearby her, so that's generally going to be a little bit on the unreliable side. Fights first in general is pretty good, it's just whether or not it's worth 60 points, and specifically for demonettes, particularly as the character themselves doesn't really add a whole ton of melee power. The Infernal and Rapturous is the demonette with the great big man harp, 65 points for a 3 wound herald once more, similar sort of melee attacks but also getting a little bit of a range shot with one last cannon equivalent type shot or a whole bunch of strength 6 AP 0. Her thing is to regenerate D3 demonettes each command phase and can make psychic weapons within 12 inches hazardous, a bit matchup dependent that one. I guess perhaps the biggest issue is whether or not the demonettes actually manage to survive to the next command phase. They're not exactly a tanky unit, and I just can't help but think it's more likely for them just to be wiped out completely than just taking a bit of chip damage and then going about their business. The Contortus Epitome is 85 points, again a demonette leader. Really quite a lot tougher at 8 wounds at toughness 6, though the toughness 6 could be undermined a bit by the toughness 3 of the demonettes, at least for the volume of attacks that wipes out the demonettes in the first place. In combat, the epitome is a bit more threatening compared with regular demonettes, getting a few strength 5 AP 1 and damage 2 attacks with the coiled tentacles as well. 
The buffs it gives is a 4 plus fill no pain type save against mortal wounds and psychic attacks and gives one enemy unit within 12 inches a minus 1 to hit most of the time. If you roll a 6 then it's not eligible to shoot at all, kind of similar to the changeling. Again just perhaps feels like it just doesn't really add all that much for the cost compared with more demons units. If anything I might be a bit more tempted just to run this entirely independent of demonettes as a random individual unit threat. At least he gets 8 wounds at toughness 6 which is a little bit tougher than some of the other things and he could deep strike it somewhere and mess with enemy shooting similar to the changeling I suppose. Overall just not really that great for 85 points I think though. 405 points there's the Mask of Slanesh, a lone operative character so not leading demonettes this time. They attack with a flurry of damage 2 demonette type claws with the devastating wounds but there's still only 6 of them and they can get around the table quite quickly advancing and charging or potentially falling back or charging if needed. The mask's main purpose is being a buffing unit, giving you a plus one to wound in melee for one unit within six inches, and also making them minus one to wound as well. Between the two, that's some really quite powerful damage and defense debuffs. That does involve the mask being right on the front line, perhaps not the best when there are only four wounds with a four plus and vulnerable save, and their only real protection is not being shot due to lone operative. If you can coordinate it so the buffs go off on something very meaningful, then it's probably fine. I feel like a bit costly for 105 points though. In terms of lone operative type shenanigans, I've definitely seen a lot more people take the changeling or the blue scribes. Finally for Slanesh, and perhaps one of the single best data sheets, is Silesk. 120 points for a demon prince and herald pairing. Can lead demon X, though is kind of viable just to not bother at all and go off on their own. If you do choose to lead demon X, then it makes their devastating wounds a bit better. Wound rolls of 5 plus score a critical wound, making them far more dangerous against tougher targets. Just in their own right though, they add really quite a lot. 9 wounds at toughness 6 with a 4 plus invulnerable save is alright. Though in reality their durability is actually kind of good due to delightful agonies allowing them to respawn on a 2 plus the first time that they die. Means that for the 120 points you're actually more like getting 18 wounds at toughness 6 most of the time. And with the added complication that your opponent might kill them in the fight phase and then they just respawn at the end of the fight phase. So you get another turn to go about doing your killing. On the attack they get a whole bunch of AP1 damage 1 attacks within close range. Usually should be around about 11 or 12 hits on the opponent between Cacophonic Choir and the Scourging Whip. Then in combat it's the Demon Prince doing most of the heavy lifting with a big 6 attacks with Strength 7 and Damage 3 plus a few extra ones from the Herald. Overall just really quite a scary datasheet given the big respawn. Quite a nice unit for clearing out enemy troops with all of those AP1 Damage 1 attacks and will definitely leave its marks on Elites as well with the Strength 7 Damage 3. I'd rate them as perhaps one of the best Lanesh datasheets overall, maybe along things like the Seekers and Shalaxi Hellbane perhaps. Finally for the Legions of Demons we have the Undivided ones, or the ones that you need to dedicate to one god or another. First up we have the Master of Shadows, Belakor himself, 350 points and went up a bit. Essentially a greater demon sort of stat line profile, 18 wounds and toughness 10 with a 4 plus and vulnerable save. Stealth to keep him safe if the enemy can shoot him. But perhaps more importantly, one of his shadow form abilities means that you can't be shot if you're outside of 18 inches for him or units within 6 inches. That one means that you can have Bellacore in the centre of your army and basically counter gun lines on the first turn. They could be right out in the open and unless they can get within 18 inches, they won't be able to shoot Bellacore or anything nearby. Otherwise, he has a fair bit of damage output himself, 12 attacks at strength 6 and AP 3 with Betraying Shades. That could potentially just get rid of a lighter infantry unit then and there. And in combat he strikes with a blade of shadows, 6 attacks at strength 14 and damage d6 plus 1, or a sweep attack with strength 8 and ap3. For 350 points I don't think his damage output is standout, it's mainly the shadow special rule, and perhaps just as importantly the fact that he carts around with him an aura of the shadow of chaos, everything within 6 inches always counts as being within the shadow. So you could move him up the board and then have units deep strike really quite close to him and make 6 inch charges out of reserve on other enemy units nearby, never mind the damage that Bellacore himself could do. Overall I still definitely rate him as a very strong datasheet and one of the best in the codex, you do pay a premium for him. But both the Shadow of Chaos special rule and also his wreathed in shadows to prevent shooting can both be game changing. Otherwise for the other undivided datasheets we've got the Soul Grinder, 200 points for a big tough Toughness 11, 3 plus save and 14 wound vehicle with a 4 plus invulnerable, definitely very tanky at that kind of profile. 
Hits quite hard against tanks and vehicles with the Iron Claw at a big damage D6 plus 2 and strength 16. And then a few extra attacks, either a Warp Claw or a Warp Sword, depending on whether you want to be a bit better against lighter infantry or against heavy targets. I think I'd probably be a bit more tempted by the Warp Claw on balance, but not by much. Then you get to mark him to one of the four Chaos Gods, and as well as a few synergies, the main thing that that decides is what sort of shooting attack he gets alongside his Auto Cannon style Harvester Cannon. I think they're fairly balanced in their own right, either a big heavy flamer for Korn, a little bit of Ignore's line of sight shooting with the Flem Bombardment for Nurgle, the Scream of Despair that's very good at killing Space Marines for Slanesh, and Warp Gaze for a few big hitting anti-tank shots from Zinch. I feel like most of those are kind of fine choices to be honest. Indirect fire is handy to have, though a bit of big hitting anti-tank firepower doesn't seem the worst idea in Chaos Demons, they get very little of that at range. Again, like a few things, I think he went from being a kind of bad data sheet to a lot more playable at 200 points. Maybe a little bit inflexible and predictable though, compared with some. Maybe not the worst to have as a bit of an anchor unit to slog into the midfield and put objective control 5 on those objectives and give your opponent something to chew on while the rest of your army does its thing. Finally, we've got the two different variants of Demon Prince. This one's the on foot one at 200 points. A profile of toughness 10 at 10 wounds and a 2 plus armor save with a 4 plus invulnerable, going up to a 3 plus invulnerable for a single phase of the game for a big boost of survivability. Overall, I'd say they're maybe not the most exciting competence for the cost. A heavy bolter style profile with the infernal cannon and then strength 8 and damage 3 attacks in melee. Perhaps the main attraction to take one is the Prince of Darkness type special rule, giving you an aura of stealth for nearby demons. I think it is okay, but maybe might be a bit redundant in some lists if you have Bellicor on the go, countering gun lines in general. Though if not, and you do have a lot of demons moving up to take the midboard, having stealth on the pack isn't the worst. Like the Soul Grinder, you get to choose one of the four Chaos Deities to pledge him to. Could be relevant for some synergies with other models, but also gives him a direct boost. Corn gives him extra strength. Zinch gives him extra shots with his Infernal Cannon, Nurgle gives him a Toughness 11, and Slanesh gives him plus 2 movement. I think they're all kind of fine really, maybe it depends on what you really want him to do. The Corn getting him to Strength 10 I don't think is the worst though, that could mean that he could tangle a bit better with things like Battle Tanks or Terminators wounding them on a 2. Lastly for the Demonic Data Sheets we've got the Winged version of the same thing. The Winged Prince gets a 12 inch move and fly, but drops down to Toughness 9. And the main thing otherwise is just that his special abilities get moved around. Rather than giving an aura of stealth, he just gets a lot more damage boost just in his own right. He gets to choose either lethal hits, precision or sustained hits with his Harbinger of Death rule each time he fights. And then once per game another very serious melee boost going up to 9 attacks on his Hellforge weapon strike mode. Really quite a big punch in combat there. I feel like that's enough to make him into genuinely quite a scary threat. I feel like Korn's probably going to be even more tempting for him though. 9 attacks at strength 10 and damage 3, with either lethal or sustained hits depending on what makes sense, all sounds rather good. Finally, just for one example of how this could come together in an army list, here's a Chaos Demons list that I mentioned on the channel in another video. Just one example of a Chaos Demons army that's done well since the points update, and this one's still building around a big cluster of greater demons. Here we've got Bellicor countering shooting attacks, and he seems to be leading into combat a Bloodthirster, Lord of Change, and Shalaxi Hellbane. The Bloodthirster takes the Great Axe for the enormous damage output, and Argath, King of Blades, for the extra attacks. The Lord of Change takes the Everstave for some big shooting, and Shalaxi just kills things very, very dead, particularly big monsters and vehicles. They could all move up into the midboard, maybe threaten advance and charge due to Bellicor's shadow, and be safe from gun lines at least for a turn. Maybe things like the Lord of Change could bounce around the table by going back into reserve and deep striking early in the game. In support of them, while the big hitters get stuck into the enemy army, there's a lot of objective scorers. Two units of 10 plague bearers, perhaps one to hold a home field objective and one to move towards a midfield one to add some solid durability there. They're quite nice with their sticky objectives rule. The blue scribes to do annoying secondary objective things with their lone operative type rule. Quite a good deep striker choice and then moves fast once they're on the board. A single unit of flamers that could deep strike and threaten some fairly good anti-infantry damage, maybe even overwatch if it made sense. And then as quite a fun part of the list, there's 5 units of 3 Nurglings, really quite a lot of Nurgle's lesser servants. I guess they'd probably want to have at least some of them infiltrating into the midboard, doing a bit of area denial and generally getting in the way, hoovering up secondary objectives if they can, and maybe having some of them deep strike for just small nuisance units, doing the positional secondary objectives and making nuisance charges and having their minus one to hit debuff. 
There's definitely been a fair few lists that have done pretty well with Chaos Demons since the points updates. This one was run by Javier Palomo, who used it to take third at Art Hobbies pre national going four wins and one loss only to Eldari in a small 20-player tournament, and they have definitely had a fair few placings at bigger tournaments since then. I noticed a few Demons lists had only taken one loss at the LGT as well. Overall, I feel like Chaos Demons are maybe not one of the standout armies of 40k 10th edition anymore, but aren't in a terrible place. After the balance update, I feel like quite a lot of their units are sort of in the sort of usable but not that exciting sort of bracket, with maybe just a few that really stand out. Several of the greater demons, annoying lone operatives and nurglings, and then they're kind of spoilt for choice for all the various flavours of slightly less threatening support units, everything from streamers to seekers to flamers, and either annoying horrors or plague bearers for some objectives perhaps. Really quite a cool army though that plays in a very different way, jumping on and off the board and doing all sorts of deep strike shenanigans, perhaps a force that tends to do a little bit better in the hands of experienced players as a result than more casual ones. Choosing the right way to utilise all that manoeuvrability can be kind of tricky. In any case, let me know your thoughts on the faction, including on any other insights to the units that I might have missed in the main video. Look forward to hearing all your thoughts down in the comments below. If you've enjoyed the video, then feel free to subscribe to Allspets Tactics, where I'll certainly keep the regular 40k videos coming. I do tend to post new ones just about every day. Finally, if you have been enjoying all the videos on the channel, I would just like to mention that Allspets Tactics does have a Patreon page as well, and you can find that linked in the video description if you'd like to help support and keep all this content coming. Channel patrons do get a fair few advantages, seeing certain videos early each week, regular votes to see what sort of things happen next on the channel, and automatic entry into the regular prize giveaways with a chance to win some big model kits each month. If any of that sounds good to you, or you'd just like to help support video creation, then that's linked down in the video description below. In any case, an enormous thank you for listening, or hail the dark gods, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.